Hi, welcome to the analysis.news. I'm Paul Jay. We'll be back in just a few seconds to discuss the results of the Brazilian elections and try to answer the question, how the hell was that election so close? Uh, please don't forget there's a donate button uh, coming near the end of the year, and I know people are thinking about donating some money, unless you lost it all in the stock markets, in which case I, you have my uh, sympathy. Uh, but if you do have some money to donate and you might like to donate to the analysis, please uh, come to our website and click on the donate button. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and get on the email list and be back in just a few seconds. So Lula has won the presidential elections in Brazil by a whisker. Maravilhoso, gente. Nós ganhamos, nós recuperamos o Brasil. Recuperamos o Brasil depois de quatro anos. 50.9% to Bolsonaro's 49.1%. So why was it so close? Bolsonaro is arguably even crazier than Donald Trump. He mishandled the COVID situation even worse than Trump, if that's possible. And his family and many of his allies are up to their eyeballs in corruption. So why did he come within 2% of Lula and almost get reelected? And given the amount of support this far-right politics has, what does it mean for the future of Brazil? Now joining us to help answer that question is Lorena Barbaria. She's a professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Sao Paulo. Thanks for joining me again, Lorena. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here and have a chance to talk about these really exciting moments in Brazil. So before we get into what what may come next, let me ask you, I, I was in Sao Paulo in uh, the early 90s. So that's what, what 30 years ago. I was researching a film called Modern Slavery at the time and went up to the Amazon and places. But I I was in a uh, in Sao Paulo and and I was meeting with uh, worker after worker who was progressive. Uh, many of them were unionized auto workers, although I was surprised to find how many auto workers lived in barrios, but I guess that, that at least then was the case, may still be. Uh, but the barrios were far from any place that I would have thought could ever have supported Bolsonaro. But after four years of, of Bolsonaro, who, like I said, is probably more batshit crazy than Trump and probably mishandled the COVID crisis worse than Trump, how the heck does he come so close to being reelected? Okay, so we have to let we have to go a little bit, a little bit back in history to, to understand the present. But I think what's important about what you were talking about, about being in Sao Paulo in that period in which which is when Lula starts his political career, is throughout this period, we have kind of very a dramatic and very difficult economic uh, reality in Brazil, especially if we look at the last couple of years, we've had really lackluster growth before Bolsonaro was elected already. So we, had, we have kind of recurring economic crises, deindustrialization, and that, uh, in, that kind of culminates in rising unemployment before already before uh, Bolsonaro gets elected. And so there's kind of a, Bolsonaro gets elected kind of as a surprise candidate. And it's really important to remember, he gets collect, elected, his political platform is PowerPoint slides. He doesn't even have a government plan when he launches his presidential election bid in, in 2018. He's kind of a surprise outsider and no one expected him to be elected. Um, but the reaction and the response to the PT and to the corruption scandals was so strong that he he slowly starts to get uh, gain speed in the election and he gets attacked, he gets a knife, he gets uh, someone stabs him with a knife during the electoral campaign and he gets hospitalized. And that's a major turnaround in the 2018 election in which he rises um, and he really, that's once once that happened and, and there was that, as that attempt, which some have even questioned if it really happened or if it was orchestrated. Um, and it's there's, there's disputes about if he was really attacked physically and violent, violently, but 
that was a major turning point in the election. And after that, it was very difficult for him uh, to be defeated. And Fernando Haddad comes very, uh, who is the ex minister of education in in Lula's government, came close, but not uh, not he 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 the the first he lost in the first round, and in the second round he he lost by 44 per, he he only earned 44 percent of the votes. And that's the candidate of the PT, the Workers Party. Yeah. Yes, as a candidate of the PT, so. <laughs> coming kind of very quickly up to thinking about what's happening before this election, we have already in Brazil a very stark kind of strong contrast between the PT, which changed a lot from the PT in in the moment when you're talking about how the PT originated and the origins of the PT. The PT became kind of a mainstream political party, negotiated with the center, governed with the center, the the vice president in Lula's first and second terms and in Dilma's terms, first term and second term, were always uh, center right parties that they aligned with in order to govern. And so the PT changed and compromised a lot in order to be able to govern in Brazil. And the in the in the 2018 election, there was already kind of a very strong anti PT uh, reaction to corruption allegations, and that made it very difficult uh, for the PT to compete uh, and to to make the candidacy. But the other reason was that Lula was denied the opportunity to run in 2018 because of the corruption scandal, and he was in jail. Uh, and he, there was a lot of questioning of the legitimacy of the accusations, the legitimacy of the trials, how the evidence was politically motivated and, and used by judges to put him in jail. And so I think that's the backdrop leading up to the to, to 2022. Uh, for people watching, if you, if you see my earphones just magically popped on my head, it's because I had one of these battery powered things and it just died right, right on me. I thought it was okay. Um, so let me, I'll go ahead with my question. So if we go back to uh, when Bolsonaro first gets elected, uh, the, the economy is not doing nearly as well. Uh, there are a lot of the promises during Lula's time had been met. Life got better for people, but then it wasn't getting better for people. So I can understand why a lot of people get confused and vote for Bolsonaro. Uh, but now, one, the, it's not like Bolsonaro made the economy any better. And two, uh, the corruption of Bolsonaro is pretty well known. And, and I thought most of the corruption charges against Lula turned out to be uh, fabricated. And the guy who was the judge then became uh, the bloody minister of justice in Bolsonaro's government. So uh, explain this moment. How do people, half, half the popu voting population still vote for this guy? So I think what, one thing that's important to understand is in general, in this election, most of the candidates who came forward to compete against Bolsonaro weren't on the left, right? Um, most of the other candidates, the alternatives to Lula uh, is, were right-wing candidates and Bolsonaro and uh, Lula formed a coalition, what's called, what we call in Latin America is a, the Frente Ampla. So it's a broad coalition, the big tent that tries to bring the center, more progressive parties in the center to join with the PT and to run against Lula. And that's to run against Bolsonaro, sorry. So this is kind of a moderate, co broad based coalition of political parties. There's 10 parties backing Lula in the election who agree to have a single candidacy and the vice president running is from the from is a former PSDB presidential candidate who ran against Lula Geraldo Alcumin who is the governor former governor of Sao Paulo state so the idea is on one side we have a kind of center center left coalition on in addition to Bolsonaro there's more right wing parties that are launching candidates actually pushing the election to debate 
the issues even more on the right of the political spectrum than Bolsonaro already is. And that's the first round of the election. And so I think in the first round of the election, we really had uh, most of the political parties, in addition to Bolsonaro, attacking Lula's candidacy. And it was a very difficult first round, mostly centered around a lot of political scandals and accusations around corruption. Um, that was the big kind of issue. Who is more corrupt? Um, is it, do we want the corruption of the past or do we want the corruption of the present? That was kind of the, the dominating issue. Um, in the second round, we finally, as the, the other candidates disappeared and it was just Bolsonaro and Lula facing off, at least we got a little bit into some of the big issues right now in the, in, on kind of that are of concern to the Brazilian electorate. Namely, what happened during the pandemic? Was Bolsonaro right or wrong in saying that it's not his fault that the situation was as bad as it was, which is what his argument was in the elections? And the other issue was, who is more corrupt? Uh, is Lula corrupt or is Bolsonaro corrupt? And then we still had a lot of scandals in the middle of all of this, uh, taking attention away from the issues. But I think one thing that's really important to underscore is Bolsonaro got this close because the Brazilian electorate in general is quite right wing and conservative. Um, and we don't have kind of after this election, we have that that becomes really visible. If we look at the gubernatorial elections, if we look at the vote at the at the in the national election, it comes quite clear that there is a strong kind of anti PT uh, uh, vote that is very, very present in the majority of Brazil, in the majority of the states. And kind of one of the things that that had kind of make make Bolsonaro so uh, effective in this campaign was his use of kind of bringing back anything is better than bringing back the PT into government. Um, that was his his kind of big thing uh, in reminding voters is, do you really want the PT to come back? If you don't, the only way out is voting for me, which you already know what I'm about. And as it's a, an electorate that's pretty moderate and, and conservative and also very religious and the religious, the evangelical movement was very active in the elections, that really helped for him to, to secure um, more political support. I think another reason though, that's that's important to understand about how we got to where we got uh, and where we are is to also underscore that Bolsonaro hasn't yet seated, conceded the election. Um, the election results were announced last night. The judge um, the, of the Supreme Electoral Court announced the, the, the decision. The president of the Senate accepted the results. Several of his ministers have come out to acknowledge the results, but he has yet to concede the election. And that was another kind of big thing that we had looming in, 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 the, in the middle of all of this issue. The, the election was the legitimate questioning the legitimacy of the, the voting process of elections, of the way that elections are undertaken in Brazil. And so I think another reason uh, that Bolsonaro was so effective is that he cast a lot of doubt on the institutions of democracy doubt about the judiciary system, doubt about Congress, doubt, doubt about how, uh, how these inst institutions are biased against him. Um, and that he consistently kind of argues this, that he's a victim of a process that is geared to deny him political power and that some, somehow the system is always rigged against him. And he's well, we, we know we've heard that argument. <laughs> That's, We've heard that's, this yeah, all right. So he's very, yeah. but the very last Trump, part very Trumpian. Of, yes, and the last part is that because he engaged in a lot of fiscal manipulations to try to buy the election, and he got away with things that historically are unprecedented in terms of getting usually what happens right before the election. There's a lot of prohibitions on fiscal spending that you can't, you don't have a lot of room to maneuver in the six months before an election. 
Bolsonaro was granted all kinds of authorizations by Congress to spend discretionary amounts of funds, try to, to, to do different things in order to target specific places and target specific types of voters. So he increased the cash transfer program. He increased discretionary spending to specific municipalities to kind of try to wheel and deal with mayors and governors to, to go out and lobby for him and, and, and get political support for him. And there was uh, multiple kind of scandals because what, what happened is we had a very big corruption scandal around the budget, which basically what happens is he took the he took the budget, which is programmatic and converted it in a portion of this budget into a secret budget that is discretionary. And so programs that should be funded like a pharmacy d distributing medicines to pharmacies in the public health system were defunded and these funds went into a slush fund that he was using to kind of hand out to mayors and to governors to buy political uh, support. And so I think the, another reason why he got so close is because he really put a lot of economic uh, power into trying to get votes and buy votes. Um, and it's really stunning in, 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 if we look at all of what happened, then we add fake news and all the shenanigans and the scandals that were going on. It's amazing that um, we're still able to look at the results that we have right now and that Lula was able to secure the election because the degree of, of intervention, questioning institutions, qu using fiscal policy, constantly running fake news uh, and not debating the issues, it was a really difficult issue. Uh, it, it was a very difficult election to win. The uh, Now, didn't people's lives get better on the whole, working people's lives, when Lula was president? I know the left, uh, much of the left was disappointed. They thought Lula should have done more. Um, maybe he should have, maybe he couldn't have, but uh, let's put that debate aside. People's lives did get better, I, my understanding, and they did not get better under Bolsonaro. Uh, I don't get, in, in spite of everything you said, why there, you know, is wouldn't have been more disillusionment with Bolsonaro. And and I know you work specifically on the COVID issue, and and Brazil was one of the worst in the world in dealing with COVID, and he seems to have just what they used to call Reagan, Reagan, President Reagan, the Teflon man. I mean, he's, he seems to, <laughs> seems to slide off. It, it, didn't, it doesn't seem to matter. How much is, how much is Christian nationalism? How, how big a factor is this? Because is, I know in the United States, a big portion, not all, but a big portion of Trump support is evangelical Christians, right-wing uh, Catholic Christians, but Christian nationalism as a whole, and in a sense, they actually don't care what Trump does or doesn't do. He's a vehicle for, for their overarching ideology. Is that also the case in Brazil? And to what extent is the American Christian right supporting, helping, guiding, financing Christian right in Brazil? So I think it, Bolsonaro's wife is a very, um, a very prominent kind of evangelical. She's a, she follows the, the invalid evangelical kind of movement. She they bring priests, uh, pastors with them when they travel across the country. When Bolsonaro kind of accepted initially when he was a not, uh, he won the elections in 2018. On the right hand side, he brought a pastor while he read his election acceptance speech. Um, so religion and the evangelical religion has been very, very important, even more important than in, in the US, right? Because you never had Trump kind of bringing in evangelical pro poster, uh, pastors on Air Force One traveling around, um, you know, during the campaign, constantly kind of using evangelical pastors in different ways 
and using the language, even up until the last moments, Bolsonaro was tweeting biblical passages on Twitter, and his wife was as well, kind of trying to set to, to gain sensibilities with the evangelical electorate. So I think it's really important to understand. But in addition to this, um, there is a perception in this kind of I think that this movement is very different from the Christian right in in the U.S. in several instances, right? In the sense that these this even the these evangelical movement in Brazil has kind of a really really different kind of way of thinking about Bolsonaro in a way of kind of he is associated religiously as a symbol, right? Only God can explain that he survived a, an assassination attempt while running in 2018. During the election, Bolsonaro's wife used uh, a lot of analogies to, to make sure that voters understood Lula as Satan. And Lula, who is his wife, he's, he was a widow, he's married for the third time in his life. Uh, Lula's wife, as a kind of non-Christian kind of uh, maybe somebody who uh, kind of is not Catholic and we need to be worried about her religious uh, orientation as well as Lula's li or li religious or orientation. And during the last debate, Bolsonaro repeatedly accused Lula of being uh, in favor of abortion. And kind of saying, you are in a border, you are in, you are in a border. Lula his first wife died in labor. Um, he lost his he lost his firstborn child, and he lost his wife when he was very young. He was 17 years old. He lost them uh, during labor. It has nothing to do with abortion, but the way that even in this debate it was allowed to bring in it, Bolsonaro was allowed to bring into the debate and accuse Lula of being in favor of abortion. Um, and so I think kind of we don't have uh, we, we don't have an idea of or uh, a difficulty of understanding in a strongly Catholic nation as Brazil, where you have a very strong Catholic orientation, you have a very strong Christian evangelical movement. The idea of kind of manipulating and bringing this, these things of Satan and that this person is in favor of abortion, this really kind of scares or brings kind of uh, fears to, to more conservative. And, and why, uh, why is it you're saying that's different than the United States? <laughs> that's exactly what's going on in the United States. But, but we don't have abortion. Abortion isn't legal in Brazil, right? In the same way as it as in the U.S. of there's still a lot of taboos around this. So when we think about these issues, we have kind of we had these very big decisions right now in Brazil. Um, the only way that you're allowed to have abortion is in the case of rape. There was a 12 year old uh, child who was raped. And Bolsonaro's judges appointed kind of Bolsonaro judges denied the right to an abortion of the 12 year old child. And there was a huge kind of back and forth so that by the time the child was finally allowed to undergo the medical procedure because of the judicial disputes in the case, the, the, uh, the pregnancy was quite advanced. Um, but th there was two major incidents of this this kind, right? And so kind of what happened is if you think about the abortion issue, con I'm, why I'm contrasting it in the case of the US, because we don't have, it's not a, something that's common that you're allowed or that people have an experience of knowing people who have, this is a right that is a medical operation that a woman can undergo if she chooses to. It's a very kind of limited reasons and justification that a woman can under, undergo this procedure. And the only cases that came forward during Bolsonaro's administration that he really manipulated were these horrible cases of young children who have been raped and who needed uh, an abortion and who even in those cases, he was adamantly against 
the right to an abortion of these of these young children and his wife spoke about it against these so if you can think about it kind of it really kind of is an extreme scenario right because kind of thinking about little children who are raped who it's not a woman and a woman's choice this is kind of a much more even difficult issue to talk about well, well where Many where, these kids where, are where is lula on the question of abortion and what what do Brazilian women, at the very least, Brazilian women, I would think many men too, aren't aren't they willing to be pro-abortion in more cases than a child's rape, and, and not even that under Bolsonaro? I mean, why is I mean, when I, again, when I was in Brazil, I, I there was seemed like such a strong left. It's hard to understand this. It is hard to understand. Um, Lula is anti-abortion. He said that in the presidential debates when Bolsonaro attacked him. He said, "Not neither I, nor have my none of my partners in my life have ever been pro-choice." Uh, so I think that's that's important, right? If we think about the U.S. case, because the progressive candidate in the U.S. would never say or take a statement of, of disavowing uh, or 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 kind of not being vehement about a woman's right to a choice over her own body. Um, there's a very prominent uh, abort, uh, women's rights lawyer who have has done a lot of work on abortion, and she actually had to leave because of death threats, and she's in exile in the U.S. She's a, a visiting scholar. Throughout Bolsonaro's administration, she had to be with police protection because of the multiple death threats that she received. And so I think it's important to understand it is a conservative, Catholic, Christian country. Abortion is not uh, something that is, it's still a very controversial issue in Brazil. And it's a very uh, difficult issue for, for the women's movement in, in Brazil to still talk about. Con it contrasts to Latin America, right? Recently, we've seen a lot of work in, in Argentina, in Chile, in different countries in Latin America that have been able to pass legislation and that is more progressive um, around abortion and, 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 and allowing women to choose. But that is not the case yet in Brazil. And I think... And, 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 and did the Catholic Church support Bolsonaro? The Catholic Church was divided. Um, we had a lot of priests and, and bishops that also came forward and supported Lula. And I think what's important to, to also signal is that one of the reasons Lula was able to win and is kind of unquestionable is because moderate women who are political leaders in Brazil, Simone Tebet, who is a senator, she was the MD, MDB candidate in the presidential election. Marina Silva, his Marina Silva, the former his former environmental minister, but who had kind of broke away from the PT and ran as a presidential candidate uh, two elections ago. These women, who were not initially on board with Lula, came on board and became very strong supporters in the last weeks of the election. So once Simone Tebet didn't get enough votes in the first round to be uh, to be the competitor, she quickly kind of embraced Lula, embraced the coalition, became a really huge, huge uh, source of support. The same thing for Marina Silva. And there's also uh, other senators and governors that are women leaders that were really important to to kind of coming on board and, and being very, very strong political forces uh, in working to win the moderate vote to go to Lula. Um, and, and, did, so and I think did that that's important. Did the, and did the left as a whole more or less support Lula or was there division there? When it came the down to the, the final whole, election. Yes, no, the left, the left was 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 supporting Lula and was was backing Lula. The issue that is really hard is to win the middle voters, right? The swing voters and the more kind of moderate voters in the center of Brazil who were supporting Simone Tebet and Ciro Gomez as alternatives to Lula. 
But um, once the first round ended, there was a lot of, of division. And so ironically, kind of what, what really Lula needed to do is, even though he already had aligned his vice president is from the center, a center right party, Lula had to continue to kind of get more moderate supporters to get to win those voters. He didn't need kind of help on the on the left. What he needed is help on the right. Now, one of the things in the U.S. is almost all the big cities are, you know, one way or the other, at the very least, anti-Trump and and vote Democrat. And, there, and there's certainly a much more progressive vote in the big cities, and it's in the sort of extended suburbs and rural United States where you get support for the Republican Party. But I saw in Sao Paulo, the, uh, the, new, the governor is a right-wing governor in this massive urbanized city that, again, I was in, and it seemed like a left-wing city back in the 1990s. Yes. So the good news is at the national level, Lula won, but in Sao Paulo state, the largest and wealthiest state in Brazil with over 40 million people, uh, Bolsonaro's candidate, no kind of history of this political party really being a dominant force in the state. He launches this, um, this candidate, he supports this candidate, his, it's his infrastructure minister, uh, and this infrastructure minister runs against Fernando Haddad, who is the minister of education in Lula's government in the first seven years. So um, it was a very kind of important election for Lula. And Lula did a lot of campaigning in Sao Paulo. Haddad did a lot of, of work kind of, he had run against Bolsonaro in 2018. He's a major political figure, but Bolsonaro had Tarciso de Freitas running in Sao Paulo. And the anti-PT reaction in the rural part of the state was really strong. And Haddad was never able to overcome and really secure votes in rural, kind of outside of metropolitan Sao Paulo. And, it, and is, that a vote. is that a religious-driven vote? I think it's 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 not only religious i think it's also what we're talking about voters are generally center right and there's a perception especially since haddad uh ran uh when lula was in jail and lula wasn't allowed to run in 2018 that kind of haddad is seen as kind of a very left uh po political force in the state and since for for reasons that are kind of political, you know, uh, unfortunate political events. Simone Tebet decided to, to support Lula at the national level, but at the state level in Sao Paulo, she didn't lend support to Haddad. And so Haddad didn't have what Lula had at the national level. The moderate right didn't back uh, the PT in the, in the state of Sao Paulo. And so we see the results. So Haddad got 46% of the vote. I think 46 or 44, I have to check. But um, that that the big difference that Haddad needed was he needed the center-right parties to support his candidacy. And he wasn't able to secure that. And as a result, he lost. Um, so what are we stuck with and what people are worried about right now in, in Brazil? Bolsonaro, we still don't know what's going to happen in the transition. How is he going to cede power and how he's going to acknowledge the election? But the most of the people who are going to leave his administration are going to now probably be recruited to government posts in the richest state in, in, in the country. So by no means Bolsonaro and his coalition and, and uh, the, the, these people who have done kind of uh, who've been such kind of surprise political forces in Brazil for the last four years, they're not gone. Just because they, they lost at the, at the national level, we have to remember, they barely lost and they won a lot of governorships, including the richest state in, in Brazil. So they're going to be running in, and they're going to be prominent inside state governments. They're going to have 
very important posts. Um, and they're going to be very effective in, in working as an opposition to, to, to Lula at the national level and questioning what Lula is doing. Now, it seems that the Brazilian elites and, in fact, the international elites want a peaceful transition to Lula. Uh, many of Bolsonaro's allies have come out and said, yes, he wa Lula won the election. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if there's direct public quotes, but I, I saw some indirect quotes from the Brazilian military leadership who said, yes, this is a legitimate election. Uh, and the same thing happened in the United States. When Trump started looking like he, not looking, tr I think tried to organize a coup, uh, and this is not just January 6th, as everybody knows that follows my stuff. This is in, in you know, the weeks and even months before January 6th. Uh, the preponderance of American elites did not want this disruption. They wanted a peaceful transition to Biden because anything else would be bad for business. Uh, that seems to be what's going on in Brazil, and maybe Bolsonaro doesn't like it, but can he still do something even if, even if his allies uh, are ready to move on? So the military has yet to publicly make any statements um in in a sense kind of they shouldn't be making any statements right because the election results we have electoral authorities so the military shouldn't be be making any statements but bolsonaro had requested that the military undertake an assessment of electronic voting and make a report about the fairness of the electronic voting process um and so part of what is people are waiting for is the military has yet to give their assessment of Brazilian elections and um, how safe or how hack proof uh, the voting process is. Uh, I think that there's still, w w Bolsonaro can do a lot to make the transition very difficult, right? Um, he is obviously, he is afraid. He had put in um, as part of the protections he has, he had granted himself a hundred years of privacy on many of the, the kind of access to many of the things that um, we've been demanding of accountability and transparency about his policies, even his vaccines. He has a hundred year secrecy on his vaccine record. So we still have yet to know if he took a COVID-19 vaccine. He advocated uh, against giving a COVID-19 vaccine to his daughter. He criticized, he said you were turning to an alligator if you took a vaccine. His sons were vaccinated. All of his ministers of health took the vaccine, but he has never kind of publicly acknowledged if he was vaccinated. Um, so there's a lot of kind of secrecy around what what he did in, um, and, and he has granted, he granted himself a lot of protections. So there's a lot of kind of, of questions we have, which we will only really learn about on January 1st. It's very unlikely, the way things are right now, that there's going to be a transition that his government is going to be meeting with Lula's new appointees and planning the transition. The way it looks right now is that he's going to be very much uh, unwilling to, to negotiate and organize the transition and instead what he's going to do is he's going to resist up until the end that's one scenario the second scenario some people have have hypothesized bolsonaro will leave early will leave office early so given the results given how frustrated he is with the results he might renounce um, but in either of those scenarios, what's important to understand is that the next three months uh, until the, the new president takes office January 1st, there's going to be a lot of volatility, uncertainty. It's a moment where a lot of different programs are going to be interrupted because government is not working normally. And importantly, something that we saw in the last weeks of the election, the role of the police has been very, very uh very concerning, right? Um, a lot of off-duty policemen have been involved in incidents that are really questionable right now about what happened. Tarcísio de Freitas, for example, was in a neighborhood 
uh, visiting a neighborhood, a very poor neighborhood in Sao Paulo, when uh, for, for reasons that we still don't understand, a man was killed. We still don't know who killed that man, if it was somebody in Tarciso de Freitas' team, or if it was police who killed him, or if he was killed by someone else uh, in the neighborhood. But Tarciso de Freitas asked the off-duty policeman in his team to delete the evidence on the cameras that were filming the incident in order to, to not allow investigation. We had a congresswoman, congresswoman this weekend who was chasing a black journalist who was off duty, but who was arguing with her on the streets. She chased him with a gun in different streets in the city uh, over a, a dispute about the elections. Um, she wasn't arrested and she was with a off duty policeman who actually fired shots against the journalist uh, during the dispute. The uh, the there have been reports of voters voter suppression. How significant was the voter suppression? And so there's reports. We still don't have enough data to know how big uh, the voter suppression was in how many different municipalities, because it looks like it was mostly uh, something that happened more in poor municipalities, rural municipalities, where it's harder to kind of see huge numbers of differences in, in voter suppression. It's We need to look at the data really carefully to, to understand how big, but the reports are that at least in 500 cities in Brazil, the federal road police uh, put up roadblocks to delay, intimidate, uh, ask for documents so that voters would have a harder time voting. Um, so. There's a lot of evidence that on duty and off duty police officers who in large uh, in a large extent Bolsonaro supports. He's uh, kind of very kind of prominent in making an alliance and saying that he's very supportive of the police, that the police are also supporting Bolsonaro. And so I think that is really worrisome for like the daily life of Brazilians right now. Right. In poor neighborhoods in Brazil people who will be stopped and who might even be killed without a due process, without law enforcement, without um, without kind of all of the guarantees that they should be offered if they're under suspicion because of what's going on right now politically of this kind of vacuum and this uncertainty, but also this, this idea of going after your opponents and you being kind of uh, enforcing your own kind of violence in order to quell dissent, and that's so, happening. So this may Brazil. be far from, so this may be far from over, especially if the military come back with a question mark about the voting machines. Uh, the, so, in spite of what looks like the majority of the Brazilian elites may want a peaceful transition, because given the the balance of power in Congress and in the governorships. There's not a hell of a lot Lula can do anyway that's going to change things so radically. But but Bolsonaro does have the possibilities of, of refusing to hand over, and it's not a settled question. It's not a settled question. And the, and the worst thing is for what we're talking about, kind of the right, the right of to be able to, in this moment, kind of, there's so much political polarization, but we know that people who are more poor and who are more vulnerable are always going to be more victims uh, in in those situations of violence can be used against those people and, and used in a lot of times kind of in situations that are also race related. And so there's a lot of concern right now in Brazil in this atmosphere that the police feel kind of empowered uh, in order to kind of, you know, we have a couple of more months before Lula comes to power and before the transition. And this is kind of the moment where we can say in Brazil, kind of what we say is it's when you, this is the, the moment to kind of our last ditch effort to get revenge. And so that can happen in terms of fiscal spending, in terms of government programs, uh, lots of different things, but it also can happen in political violence. And I think we're worried about that in, in Brazil in this moment because we have lots 
of evidence of political assassinations, of people who are killed summarily in poor neighborhoods by police um, for, you know, there's been very kind of serious, serious evidences of 20 to 30 people who lose their lives in one night during a police operation in Rio or in Sao Paulo. And so those kind of events um, in this moment of uncertainty, they have a higher likelihood of people making their decisions and not operating necessarily within kind of strict control. And so I think we're worried. In the big cities, you know, the urban poor, and they, these go on for miles and miles, I mean, hundreds of thousands of people living in barrios, uh, or millions. Uh, did they vote PT on the whole? So uh, th I think in general, Sao Paulo, yes, for example, I think Sao Paulo really Lula owes his victory to two places, Sao Paulo, metropolitan Sao Paulo, and to the northeast of Brazil. Those were the two areas that really were critical for for the for his victory. But perplexingly, if we look at Rio de Janeiro, for example, which we have to remember, it is where Bolsonaro is based and it's where he has a, a strong political base. He has a lot of support in poor neighborhoods. Um, and one of the reasons that he has political support is also because soccer players in Brazil, which everyone knows have are very important for for young people and, and in, in the imagination of Brazilians, especially as we're on the eve of a World Cup, a lot of soccer players endorse Bolsonaro. One final question, which maybe we can dig into more another time, but just quickly, to what extent did the American Christian right support and get involved with the Brazilian Christian right? Because I know, like in Europe, Steve Bannon has been running around Europe trying to mobilize the far right of Europe. Um, they, if, you know, if it wasn't for the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, Putin was one of their heroes, and Bolsonaro was, you know, is also considered a hero of the Christian American Christian right. Uh, do they have they been involved? Um, it's very difficult to know the extent to which they've been involved, right? Um, I think Steve Bannon, we know, has a lot of contact, and he's he was he was consulted and he worked a lot on advising Bolsonaro. But as he was in right, you know, being detained in the last couple of months, it's not clear as clear how much, for example, personally he was involved in following in in uh, consulting on the Brazilian election, but. I think that there's a lot of evidence that we have, and it's not only the American Christian right, but also the right across Latin America, that there's a lot of uh, li liaisons that have been made. So Bolsonaro's sons, for example, traveled to Argentina to meet with extreme right wing candidates in Argentina on the eve of elections. Uh, there's a lot of uh, this, this is a network, and this network reaches out, follows each other, helps each other to kind of mobilize and, and use social media, and, and the different tactics are quite common in these groups. And it's not only, the, the danger I think is that it's not only in, in the US, it's in several countries in Latin America, we have similar kind of tactics and, and networks that are uh, active and they work to support each other. All right, that's great. Thanks very much. And, okay, and uh, well. in, a few, in a few weeks, we'll do it again. We'll see uh, whether there is a transition of power one way or the other. Uh, thanks again. Okay, and thank you. Thank for, you. Uh, again, please don't forget the, the donate button. We're getting near the end of the year. You're considering whether to donate uh, so uh, we are a 501c3 in the United States. Uh, we're not, uh, we don't have charitable status anywhere else, but we do in the U.S. Um, if you like what we're doing, uh, we can't keep doing it w without your support. Thanks again for joining us on the analysis.news.